This video is brought to you by Wicket Cricket Manager. So this episode of Red Inca is me, Jared Kimber, and we're going to be talking about Yashiswal, Jaiswal, because he made 100 against the West Indies recently. And I found the reaction to that 100 very, very interesting. For instance, India won that game easily, so easily that at the end, prominent Indian people suggested that the West Indies should be disbanded. I saw prominent people from other countries maybe suggest that India had actually won a world tournament further back than the West Indies had. I'm not sure how that particularly went down. I didn't follow it, but good fun times I'm sure were had by everyone on Twitter or on threads, wherever you get your social kick these days. Maybe it's TikTok. I don't know. I don't want to be too specific here. But the point is that when India won so easily with Ashwin taking all those wickets and Jaiswal making that 100, it, it appeared uh, that West Indies weren't even particularly in that game. And to a certain extent, they weren't. They gave a spinning deck to India, and India obviously handled that very, very well. Their bowlers were too good, and their batters really didn't have too much of a trouble based on the fact that West Indies had failed in the first innings. But other than the fact that people said sort of laughingly, not laughingly as in they were suggesting it laughingly, but laughingly as in, Breaking up the West Indies is nowhere near as easy as anyone thinks it is to begin with. But when they suggested that, a lot of other people were also saying that Jai Swell's 100 didn't really count. Or maybe the better way of putting it was they were saying these aren't real test runs. And I actually, I've heard that sort of stuff a lot over the years. And most of the people who worry the most about stats and how they shouldn't count or should count don't actually follow stats at all, right? If you are massively into stats you are aware that you have to look beyond one number and you have to look into these details all the time it's the people who are usually too lazy to do that and they just they're like well he averages 48 yeah but he averages 7422 against Zimbabwe a little bit unrealistic but you get my overall point and there's no doubt that when you're playing a wicket team that quite clearly you are more likely to make more runs but if you look at Jaiswell's innings in this particular case a the West Indies are weak as a batting team. They might be, and I kind of want to make this video, but also don't want to make this video, but they might be the worst batting team in modern cricket that ever came from a successful nation. They might be just the worst batting team, pound for pound, that we've ever seen. They are that bad. But their bowling isn't at that level. Kima Roach has been a fantastic bowler for a very long time and is specifically a very good bowler against left-handers, which obviously Jaiswal is. Uh, he moved the ball around. He actually should have dismissed him earlier in his innings with a LBW, but unfortunately they've blown a bunch of reviews on Virat Kohli that didn't make sense at the time, let alone all that much later. But Kima Roach is the best bowler against left-handers in modern cricket, and I count who else would be in there. I think Bumrah, Anderson, Broad would probably be the other ones off the top of my head. I'd have to go through all the stats. But essentially... Rocha has a better record against left-handers than all of those guys. And he, that he's done it on a lot of very flat pitches at times also suggests just how good he is. With him is Alzari Joseph. Now, Alzari Joseph's talent hasn't really been fully felt in test cricket. I think occasionally we see a spell. I, in fact, I started using this phrase the other day with Scott Boland. You see sort of micro spells where you see that three or four over period where you're just like, wow, this guy could be anything. And then a little while later, you realize he still hasn't actually done all that much at that point. And I think with all that in mind, uh, you would have to say that as good as Joseph is, he's not always a threat, but he certainly can bowl. Jason Holder. I think Jason Holder's story is absolutely remarkable because up until the point when his bowling flipped, it was hard to see really why he was getting a consistent game. He was an economical bowler, but he didn't really take a lot of wickets. He didn't look like he was ever going to be fast enough for international cricket. And his batting and his bowling absolutely went super duper charged overnight. He's a very smart cricketer and I love the way he goes about it. West Indies also brought in uh, Rakim Cornwall from the dead. Uh, I don't know if it's from the dead, but he made 200 in a club game in America in a T20, didn't he? But Cornwall, very tall, very strong bowler. He's an interesting bowler because... In some ways, I watch him and he thinks like a batter, I think, rather than a bowler. So it's a little bit like if Joe Root was a little bit taller, um, but he doesn't do the things that basic spinners quite often should. Like he doesn't have a very good straight ball, for instance. But because he's six foot six, six foot seven, and probably the strongest cricketer we've ever had, his ability to get pace and bounce off almost any surface is really quite good. And then the other bowler that the West Indies had was Jamal Warrican, who 
we see this every now and again. Nikita Miller might have been one of the most famous examples of these West Indian spinners who just have tons of wickets in first class level at really low average. I think and Nikita's one might have been under 20. And Jamal Warikan, I think his first class average is about 21. We've seen him bowl some good spells in test level, but he doesn't look as consistently threatening um, as in test cricket as he ever has in first class cricket but occasionally you do see it all falling apart and he's very very good and on top of that obviously Jaiswal also had to face the part-timers and we'll get to why that happened in in a little while but there's a lot of part-time overs there was um Alec Athanas who was in his first test match and bowls neat part-time off spin nothing particularly special there's Craig Brathwaite who is one of my favorite part-timers in the world because he bowls the moon ball sadly he was taking this way too seriously. Not enough moon balls in this particular um, spell. And we also saw Jermaine Blackwood, who probably shouldn't be bowling in international cricket, if we're being honest. And so because of that, uh, it would be hard to say that this was not a condi- these were not test qual- quality bowlers. You've got a five-man attack, right, that we just mentioned there. Forget the part-timers for a moment, but a five-man attack, Kima Roach, certainly above average. Azari Joseph have the, has the talent to be an average bowler. Jason Holder absolutely dominated for a lot of years. Rakeem Cornwall, there's no way to practice for someone like Rakeem Cornwall. There literally has never been another bowler of his size and strength that has ever bowled off spin in the way that he does. And Jamal Warakan is probably a very good first-class bowler who's not always the biggest threat. Well, to say that those runs don't count seems like an odd thing, right? This is a proper bowling attack. And... I understand that the overall team is weak and also that the West Indies were in a position where it wasn't particularly in their favor. Like once their batting had failed so badly, unless they got early wickets, it was always going to be a push, right? They were, they were always going to be doing their best to try and get somewhere. But realistically, unless they got what, 50 for three, they were never going to be able to put any pressure back on India. And Although I thought they bowled well at times with the new ball, and their spinners also bowled well with the newish ball as well, especially um, Rakim Komal, they just didn't get those break those breakthroughs. So very soon you have a situation where India is beating West Indies, you know, without having lost a wicket. They're already in front. They're clearly going to get a big lead, and uh, you would have to have been optimistic to think that the West Indies were going to bat again. In fact, once West, once India was in front by 100 runs or 150 runs, I should say. The chances of West Indies batting, uh, uh, making India bat again was very, very slim, right? And obviously, West Indies, uh, they just didn't have the ability to any put any pressure on. So even when they bowled good deliveries or got themselves into a good position, it's very hard. And we, we see this a lot when teams don't have a lot of, uh, we, you know, when they're in a bad position in the game. How many times do you watch a third innings where a team might be 60 runs down and they're bowling in the third innings? They take a couple of wickets and one partnership is all it takes to break that game, Right. This was a similar situation just a lot earlier in the game. So it does become almost a procession at a certain point. You know, Rohit makes his 100. Jaisal makes his 100. Obviously, Virat Kohli, he's not even batting particularly well. He makes some runs as well. And so you start to hear that these runs don't count. This isn't a real challenge. We haven't learned anything about Jaisal. Um, you know, flat track bully, uh, what, whatever else. What, what, I'm trying to think of all the different things that you hear. Uh, not, 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 te- not a real test match. These things were starting to float around. And look, it's India. So anytime India play a test match, there's going to be more stupidity floating around just because there's more people. Not because Indian cricket fans are any more stupid than any other cricket fans. Not even, you know, West Indian and Zimbabwe cricket fans can be quite intense as well. But there's just so many people in India that those sorts of things start to part, run around. But the problem is that I've just gone through a very good test bowling attack. We haven't even got to the pitch yet and we'll get to some other, um, other parts of this as well. But the point is that Jaiswal, on debut, had to overcome very, very good bowlers from a position of strength, right? On a pitch that was challenging, but not tough, if that, if that makes sense. The thought that these runs don't count has never made any sense to me. And partly because, unlike the people who quite often say, you know, that, that these, these runs shouldn't go towards your overall test average and everything else, I actually look at these things. And so I happen to know that Don Bradman's best records are against, I was going to say against New Zealand, but he never played New Zealand, but his best records are against South Africa and um, India, which were the two weakest teams he played. He only played five tests against West Indies and averaged less against them than against most teams. And then obviously against England, he had a fantastic record, but was a lot lower than it was against the other teams. That's because Don Bradman was a really good batter, right? And some may say the greatest. And so 
even he would be much better against weaker teams than he would be against stronger teams. That is part of the sport. And to take that away doesn't really make any sense. He averaged 99.94. He did not average 99.94 against England, right? He averaged less than that against England. And that's because England was a fantastic team when he had to go up against them. And he was still brilliant against them, you know, the best batter they'd ever gone up against and probably still to this day. But they still found ways to slow him down at times. They still found ways to dismiss him in a way that the weaker attacks couldn't. And the other interesting one, of course, is when you go back through Sachin Tendulkar. So now we're looking at a much more modern player, right? Sachin Tendulkar's record is very, very similar in that his best batting averages are against, I, I, want to, I think this is right, Bangladesh, Zimbabwe. And then the other team he was really good against was Sri Lanka. Now, he, Sri Lanka is a little bit trickier because Sri Lanka do get good during Sachin Tendulkar's career. But even then, it was generally one or two bowlers that, that um, Sri Lanka had, not always a full strength attack, whereas most of the other teams that Sachin would have gone up against would have been quite good. So are we saying that Don Bradman and Sachin Tendulkar are flat track bullies? Well, obviously not, right? Because they proved themselves all the way through their test career against many different teams. But when they went up against weaker teams, they found it easier to score runs because that is how sport works. I know that you think you could run your favorite cricket team better than those who do, but no one is going to let you do that. So why not try Wicket Cricket Manager to satisfy that urge? Pick your nation, pick your league, pick your players and yell at them when they do poorly. You can find it in the links below or by searching for Wicket Cricket Manager in your app store today. Now, the other side of that, of course, is that Jaiswal hasn't played any of this cricket. We don't know anything else. We just know at the moment that he has a fantastic first class average of, what was it, 79.80? Might have gone up, actually. It was probably 79 before this test match. So maybe let's say his first class average is just over 80. He hasn't played a lot of games yet, so we don't know realistically how good he is. But one method that we can tell how good players are is how easily they score against lower attacks, right? This wasn't a chancy knock. This wasn't anything else. He was in complete control. If Jaiswal had failed in this test match, that doesn't mean that we would have been able to throw it away uh, and just say that it didn't matter. People would have been looking at the dismissal and going, well, maybe he isn't as good as we thought it was. Maybe he can't handle this level. Look at the way Kemar Roach, you know, worked him over, whatever, or, or Rakin Kumar, or whoever it was that got him out. But now that he has actually made runs, right, we also want to um, then discount it. So what can Jaiswal do against the team that in the public perception is not seen as particularly good? They've just been chucked out of, well, they haven't made the final round of two World Cups in a row, different format, of course. Test cricket... They were slightly better for a little while. In fact, if you want to go back to Test Cricket, of course, they did actually beat England, what, a year and a half ago? I think as Bayram might have uh, mentioned on a previous uh, podcast. So th they are very, very good cricket team when conditions suit them, when their bowling is firing. They don't make any runs, which means that away from home, they're kind of useless because their bowlers have to completely dominate all the time. But they can be a very good team when things go their way. They're clearly not an above average team. And they, they shouldn't be a team that should get anywhere near India as India as the second best test team in the world over the last three or four years, maybe even the best over the last four years. And so obviously a young Indian player comes in and makes runs, but you can't just say that because he's made these runs, he's, they don't count or they're soft runs or anything else because he still has to be able to make them. And for me, that was the thing that I thought was the best. And this all comes into another conversation I had with a friend recently where he was trying to work out what a clutch cricketer is. And for those of you who don't follow a lot of American sports, obviously clutch is the word that they use a lot. It basically comes through basketball as much as anything else. Um, although, you know, baseball is certainly another sport that they talk about it a lot. So in, in these sports, they're talking about the people who can perform at those most important moments. The problem with that is, of course, that A, identifying those most important moments is a massively subjective task, right? And even in basketball, you'll see situations where it'll be like, let's say, I think it's, they sometimes do the final five minutes of a game when it's less than five points uh, difference, or maybe the final two minutes of the game with less than five minutes, five points between the two teams. The problem with that is you might not play in a lot of situations like this because you're such a good player that you've actually got your team well in advance, but also that it's a really small sample size of times that you're actually going to be able to do that. So a couple of years ago, there was a player in the NBA called DeMar DeRozan who hit two incredible shots to win games at the end and everyone started calling him the most clutch player in the world. 
Overall, his numbers haven't been as magnificent as that particular moment, but two back-to-back -back shots to win a game in a row, and they were incredible shots as well, meant that suddenly he was sort of as that. Realistically, the best players in the clutch are probably going to be the best players all the way through, because that's kind of how these things work. And that goes back to the Bradman and Tendulkar. Yes, they're better against the worst teams, but they're also better against the best teams. And we don't know if Jaiswal will ever get there. But when we're looking at these sorts of, you know, metrics, you can't just pick and choose uh, exactly. You, you can't pick and choose what test runs are. You can weight them in different ways. We have many different ways of doing that. You know, there are certain pitches where people score more runs. So we can weight those a little bit lower when someone does it. There are certain attacks where people make more runs. Not specifically the West Indies. They average about 32 runs uh, per wicket. So maybe slightly higher than global test cricket, but not particularly that much. But again, you can weight that and you can weight it on the individual bowlers that they're going up against. Uh, you know, we, I think Katakea recently put up something about the bowlers averages and uh sorry batters averages against uh start this again what the bowlers averages were against specific batters we can now work out so at the time when they face them so we can see that um i want to say it was steve smith had much went up against much tougher bowlers than there was a batter in the in the era before him whoever that was i can't remember who kartike put him up against. so we now have the ability to weight all those sorts of things but no player is going to, let's say that three toughest teams in the world at the moment are England, Australia, and India. And let's say the three weakest bowling attacks are, uh, off the top of my head, let's say Bangladesh, um, Pakistan, although Shaheen's back, um, and I don't know, New Zealand, now that they're losing all their best bowlers, right? There's no player in the world who's going to average like 35 against all those bad attacks and 55 against all the good attacks. And if they are, it's probably over a smaller sample size, right? And there's probably other mitigating facts. The truth is that anyone who's going to do anything like that, who's going to be a clutch player, is going to be good already. So Jaiswal making runs against the West Indies should be seen as a positive thing. And yet, quite often, you look at these things and it's not. And one thing, when I was having this conversation about clutch players and how we look at it in cricket, I used the example of Stuart Broad. Nothing like Jaiswal at all. But... What I think we should be looking at doing in cricket is actually trying to work out why players are particularly good at different parts of the game. You know, we've just done that, you know, big series on um, Steve Smith and, and Ian Botham not being particularly good in the fourth innings. And we can work way through with, with cricket log logic to find that sort of thing. So Stuart Broad is someone who's taken a lot of big hauls in very important games for England. And if you go back through his career, there's some remarkable spells where he comes from nowhere and does incredible things. And so it would be very easy to say that Stuart Broad is a clutch performer based on that. But we actually need to have a look at who Stuart Broad is. So the first thing is we know he's not as technically solid as Jimmy Anderson. Very few things ever go wrong with Jimmy Anderson's action. He puts the ball pretty much where he wants it all the time. He's more accurate than Broad. He's more skillful than Broad. He has more tricks up his sleeve and he does everything very well. Stuart Broad is someone who grew up as a batter. I wouldn't say he's still learning bowling, but I think he thinks about bowling in a slightly different way than perhaps other frontline seamers do. He's also someone who is very lanky and has a lot of different moving parts. And so there are many different days when Stuart Broad is not doing exactly what you would want him to do as a bowler. So the best way of po pointing this out is if you've ever heard the, the term knees up, they say that when Stuart Broad gets his knees up nice and high and pumping, he gets through his action a lot better, is a little bit quicker, and can do whatever he wants with the ball. He can't do that all the time. And it's because he's not as in control of his body as someone like Anderson, who's a different kind of athlete. But when Broad does get those knees up pumping, when he gets through the crease at pace, when he's running in exactly what he wants to do, and he can control the ball with his wrist exactly as it should be, Stuart Broad just takes a lot of wickets. And that is because he can move the ball in both directions. He's very tall. And when he was younger as well, he also had quite a lot of pace. Like he's a fantastically talented cricketer on many different, on, in many different ways. And when you look at someone like that, when he gets it right, what are you supposed to do? He gets wickets in sprees, not because he's a clutch player, but because when his body is doing exactly what he needs to do, Unlike Anderson, who is a fantastic bowler, he doesn't have the extra foot and a half of height that, that um, 
that Broad has. And so Broad has the ability to put all those things together in a small period of time, and he can keep that momentum going as long as his body keeps doing the right thing. So by momentum, I don't mean sporting momentum. I mean, literally, he's getting through the crease properly. He's doing all the little things, getting his left arm as high as it should be, keeping his wrist in the exact position when he's at his most dangerous, all these sorts of things. That is why Stuart Broad is a spree wicket taker, because once he gets it right from his pace and with his skill level and with his height, he is pretty much unstoppable. That works for Stuart Broad when you see him bowl for Nottingham and everything's working and it works all the way through to, you know, some of the best batters in the world when they're going up against him. That is what you were really looking for in these moments. And so I want to bring this back to Jaiswal a little bit here. There's a few really interesting things that happened that when in Jaiswal's favor and occasionally went against him. So for instance, Jaiswal is left-handed. And if you go through the West Indian bowling attack, you find that Kemar Roach is the only bowler who is a plus against left-handers that was playing in that game against him. Having said that, Kemar Roach is probably the best seam bowler against left-handers. So it's quite a guy to go up against. Cornwall was the only other one who should have been like that. But Cornwall's not a particularly good bowler to left-handers. However, in this particular case, Cornwall was actually getting bounce and the ball was ripping for him. That is when he is at his most dangerous against left-handers and he certainly beat the bat quite a lot. Having said that, Roach didn't bowl a lot of overs and Cornwall didn't bowl a lot of overs. Cornwall was off the field uh, with an illness and Roach actually had a, um, it just wasn't bowled. I don't know why, he only bowled 11 of the first 80, 98 overs or something ridiculous like that, All right? Then you look at another advantage. This was a pitch that was probably, I wouldn't say it was an Asian pitch because it certainly had some good bounce and carry at times, but it wasn't a quick pitch by any um, measure. And it certainly was a pitch where you're going to have to bowl a lot more spin. Jaiswal plays spin very, very well. So that's a huge advantage to him in this sort of situation. And Cornwall, as I said, was off the field. He was the one who looked most likely to get Jaiswal out when he was bowling very well. The other thing was that there was a little bit of uh, swing around, but the wobble ball wasn't particularly useful because the pitch wasn't giving a lot of lateral movement. So again, you've got all these different things that went in Jaiswell's favor. And that's before you throw in the fact that at one stage, I think Cornwell and Holder were off the field and West Indies had to bowl a bunch of part-time spinners. These are all things that happen to make Jaiswell make that 100. These are all things that happen kind of every time someone makes a 100. There is usually some other uh factor maybe the pitch is in their favor maybe the ball went soft uh, maybe these are the kinds of bowlers they match up well against uh, maybe the the opposition have decided to pitch the ball up a little bit fuller and they're a tall batter and they're getting on top of it all these sorts of things happen in every hundred we don't usually focus on all these different ideas right partly because most of us don't have time to watch these games as closely Right. That's a that's a very, very re uh, reasonable thing. The other thing is not everyone's trained to look for all these sorts of things. Right. I've been trained for it kind of since birth at this point. And so I notice all these little things that other people probably won't. And that's completely fair. But there's other things that you notice through Joyce Wells innings. So, for instance, he did start a little bit flashier. I think he was trying to show that he could play all the shots. He came out like a millionaire, played as much as he could, and then he pulled himself back. Right. That on its own is really interesting. A, he was willing to attack. He clearly wanted to score faster. And then a combination of some good bowling, probably by Cornwell, but also the pitch just didn't allow Jaiswal to score at the rate that he wanted to in a safe way. That is what top-level batting is, right? A, another batter will just keep pushing until they're out, right? Or they'll be the opposite. They'll just go very defensive and they won't score as much. He found a really, really good third to fourth gear, maybe even a second gear at times, to be able to do the job that he needed to do. Then you have a look at his technical skills. He's not fully tested. We didn't see him massively being bounced. I think they should probably should have bowled some more short spells to him uh, just to try uh, the short stuff, just because India had got uh, you know at least one wicket by trying that. I would have loved to see that a little bit. We would love to see Jaiswal against the moving ball, uh, you know, the lateral moving ball. And we didn't get to see either of those two things. But from what we saw technically, whether it was against pace or skill, there really weren't a lot of flaws on, on show, right? Again, these are the sorts of things that you're looking about. If I'm looking at someone playing first class in Division 2 in county cricket or a second 11 game in Australia or you know, a Ranji game against you know, ordinary bowlers, I'm looking at all these same sorts of things, 
right? I quite often go down and watch the the A teams play when they play in London. I used to love that they, you know, it hasn't happened as much since COVID, but sometimes you get three or four A teams in England at the same time. You know, they play a couple of games in London. You go down and watch them. You What you're really looking for is not a specific dominant performance by any one player. What you're really looking for is all these little things. Can they do everything? Can they gear up? Can they gear down? Can they change their game when the pitch is? Can they change their game for different kinds of bowlers, right? I'm looking for the same thing there that I would be against the West Indies. The only difference is that Kemar Roach is a much better bowler than Jaiswal um, is going up against in those other games, right? And that is something when, when people are saying that the West Indies aren't particularly good, Jaiswal is not facing Kemar Roach in a first-class game in India. This is a step up no matter how you look at it. It's not the same step up as going up against Mitchell Stark and Pat Cummins and Josh Hazelwood and Cameron Green and, and Nathan Lyon, right? It's not the same step up as going up against, you know, the, the South African attack at the moment or the Indian attack at the moment. But it's still a massive step up from what you normally face in first-class cricket. And that's what I'm looking for. And when you go through all those different markers and you look at the fact that that when this pitch was tricky, and it wasn't always hard to bat on, but I had moments where it was a little bit tricky, he still found ways to handle himself, to bat appropriately, and to move away. And I think the finding the ways is the most important thing. This is not a flat track bully. Virat Kohli certainly didn't make this pitch look particularly flat. This is not a situation where the runs don't matter. There are innings in test cricket, sometimes in the third inning specifically, where runs just do not matter. There's a there's a video I've always wanted to make about the most pointless innings in test cricket history. And there's some rippers out there when you have a really good look. But the point is that in this particular situation, Jaiswal was not a flat track bully and his runs did count. It just happened to be that they went up against a team that was already behind the game because of how they batted. That doesn't change what he did when he was on the pitch and the attack that he faced. We have to put context on every single thing too often, I think now, when it comes to batting, everyone is only making runs when the pitches are flat and they never make any runs when the pitches are moving, which is exactly the case of kind of every moment of cricket in the history of mankind. You always make runs against easier teams. You always make runs on flat pitches. That's what Sachin did. That's what Bradman did. That's what Hobbs did. That's what Grace did. The best players find a way to still be handy in the toughest situations. We have no idea if Jaiswal can do that, but we do know that he can make 100 against a very, very interesting attack on a tricky to moderate surface as this was. That ain't nothing.